theories of separation. Maybe you've heard of it. It's a theory that was first put forth in the 1920s, not by a scientist, but by a writer who believed that any one person on the planet is connected to another person by no more than through a chain in which there's no more than five intermediaries. Have you heard of this? So let's say, for example, that uh, there's a, a woman living in the mountains of Nicaragua. She and I are connected, and I would only have to go through five of my acquaintances to figure how it is that I know her. So mathematicians and sociologists and playwrights and all kinds of people have made efforts to prove or disprove this theory. It's the subject of films and books and board games and, this morning, a sermon. I find it fascinating to consider that a stranger uh, is only five people away from being someone that I might actually know and have a connection to. Relationships and connections are fascinating. Uh, it really is a small world. And this morning, I hope to get us thinking about our connection to, or perhaps separation from, not some stranger in another country, but from the spiritual gifts that God has given us. But before we move along and I try to connect all of this to the scripture, will you pray with me? God, steady my hand and strengthen my voice, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart here would be heard and pleasing and welcomed and acceptable to you, our rock, our redeemer, and the giver of all our gifts. Amen. Amen. So Ephesians is a letter traditionally thought to have been written by Paul, and it is addressed to the church in Ephesus. In its time, Ephesus was an important port city in the Roman world. Ephesus was located in what would now be modern-day western Turkey. As many cities on the sea, Ephesus was a place of trade and commerce, and there was a great deal of economic activity. It was also a place where education and entertainment and the arts were highly valued. It was home to many intellectuals. It was one of the fastest growing urban areas under Roman rule. So why does this culture, bustling, intellectual city receive a letter? Well, unlike some of the other cities receiving letters that we read about in the New Testament, there doesn't seem to be a huge crisis in Ephesus. So let's take Corinthians, for example. There's some trouble in Corinth, some real trouble in the church there. And Paul writes this young church about its immature behavior. People are fighting and suing each other and engaging in a wide array of behavior that is unbecoming to anyone, but particularly to Christians. The church in Ephesus seems to be a relatively peaceful place, no major problems or conflicts. And while there is no huge crisis, there's no war, there's no plague, there is some cause for concern. The troubles in Ephesus are internal, in the minds and the souls and the hearts of the Christian believers. Spiritually, the church is being tempted by the culture around them, and they're questioning how they are to live in a society where there are multiple forms of faith and many ways to practice your religion. Maybe this sounds familiar to us today. The purpose of the letter is to encourage the church there on their faith journey. The author realizes that the church of Ephesus exists within an empire and also recognizes that where one lives affects how one lives their faith. The first three chapters of Ephesians focus more on doctrine and belief. Here's what Christians believe, here's why we believe it, and here's a little bit of our history that's mixed up in that. But then we move into chapter 4, and the letter changes. We move from a, a lecture with facts and information to something that's more practical. You know who God is. You know who Jesus is. You know what and why the church is. So now take this information and go and live like you know it. Go and apply it. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling 
to which you have been called. Jesus isn't the only child of God with a calling. Paul, with his dark past and multiple stays in prison, had a calling. In our society, prisoners and inmates are at the very bottom of our social ladder. So it's important for us to remember that Paul spent time incarcerated. This fact reminds us that God calls everyone, that everyone, even the most unlikely social outcast, is a part of the plan and is a part of the body of Christ. I have a calling, you have a calling, we together have a calling. So what does it mean to lead a life worthy of the calling? Well, based on a reading of Ephesians, to lead a life worthy of the calling is to live life with others in a community that functions as a single entity. Something interesting to note about, about verses 3 through 6, maybe you heard this when the scripture was read, but the word one is found seven times. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Why all the ones? To support rugged individualism? To suggest that everyone is on their own? To promote the notion that there is only one way or one type of person or one calling that is worthy? No. It's actually the opposite. These ones actually point to unity. You see, my calling is not at the exclusion of yours. And your calling, although different from mine, isn't a source of division, but rather of unity. Now, I went to elementary school just up the road from here, and I remember learning in math class that one means one. If there's more than one, the answer cannot be one. But mathematical rules do not really apply to spiritual matters. Verse 7. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. When we think of grace, it's common, particularly for us as Wesleyans, to think of grace as God's unmerited love and favor. But used here, there's actually another meaning. The Greek word charis is likely a form of the Greek word charisma, which refers to divinely given gifts or talents. So what if the verse sounded like this? But each of us was given divine gifts and talents according to the measure of Christ's gift. What is the gift of Christ? It's his body, the church. The church is the body of Christ. So I invite you for a minute to engage in this imagery. We all have bodies with the head and with many parts and limbs and members. We have organs and tissues and cells. If any one of these things is missing or not functioning properly, what do we do? We seek out medical help so that we can be healthy and whole. And there are some parts of our bodies, if they're missing or are not functioning, well, that means that we cease to be alive. The church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head of the church, and we are the arms and the legs and the hands and the feet and the eyes and the ears and so on. As much as we need God and Jesus, we need each other. And it's not just the other people that we need, but the gifts that each person brings to the body are what we, the church, need. Each and every one of us has received divine gifts from God. To be used not for our own glory or social mobility, but for the sake of the unity of the church. And that God's will will be done here on earth. So before coming today, I talked on the phone with your pastor and she shared with me that you've been doing some work on spiritual gifts. She gave me a copy of Serving from the Heart and I was able to read that over. She asked me today to give some thought to chapter 4 which is about individuality. Seems pretty simple. We are all unique. Within each and every one of us is something that no one else possesses.
Kids need to hear this, but so do us grown-ups. Not only are we unique, but so too are the gifts that are in us. One of my uh, favorite preachers that I, that I like to listen to and read her blog is Nadia Bowles Weber. She's a Lutheran pastor in Colorado. She's an amazing preacher and speaker, and when she stands in the pulpit, she usually does so in a sleeveless shirt. She's covered in tattoos. She uses language that if I used today would probably get me in trouble. She's unique. You see, as a recovering alcoholic, her gifts and her style and her authenticity are drawing people to the body of Christ who might not otherwise come to church. And I came across one of her sermons online that she gave about spiritual gifts. I actually listened to it multiple times, and what I took away from it was this. She talked about a church member who likes yoga. So the pastor said to this member, if you like yoga, you should go get trained and certified so you can teach yoga. Within a year, this woman had gone out and was certified and was teaching yoga all over. She started leading a church, our class at the church. And so once a week, she had this huge group of people that were coming. They weren't just doing yoga and stretching. They were lighting candles, and they were praying, and they were meditating, and they were sharing each other's joys and concerns and struggles. So Nadia Bowles Weber goes on to ask the question, what if we, for some reason, all thought that having the gift of teaching yoga was the true mark of a Christian? Now, I'm not here today to suggest for a second that we should all leave and go and get certified in yoga. I share this to suggest that we, the body of Christ, have a flexibility problem. We cannot see spiritual gifts or the purpose for which we receive them fully. If you're good at yoga and others can live better, healthier lives by participating in yoga, then yes, yoga is a gift, a spiritual gift. Perhaps you've already worked through serving from the heart, and you've already begun the process of reflecting on what your gifts are. The Bible gives examples of spiritual gifts, the gift of wisdom, knowledge, faith, discernment, miracles, prophecy, healing, teaching, preaching, encouraging. Do any of these gifts sound familiar? Do you claim any of these gifts as your own? Is there a gift that you have that isn't included in any of the Apostle Paul's letters? There's no yoga there. If someone came to you this morning asking to use one of their gifts to support the church, would you turn them away because that gift isn't listed on the approved list? There was a time in my life when I didn't think that I had any gifts to offer anyone, especially the church. What could I, with all my pain and brokenness, have to bring to the body of Christ? It was a long and painful journey, but through the help of some other gifted members of the body, I came to realize that I did have gifts. In fact, they'd been there all along. It took others with the gifts of patience and understanding and wisdom and discernment and encouragement to get me to a place where I could name and claim my gifts. I had cut myself off from the body, but other members with gifts of persistence continually invited me to reconnect. Why did they do this? Why did they use their gifts on me? Because they understood the purpose of their gifts, which is to bring unity to the body. When any member of the body is missing. The body is not complete. Who's not here today? Who's across the street living with their family that you don't know that's not a part of this body? Who's around this area that has gifts that can make this place a more incredible, more vital church? Let us be careful, though, not to confuse unity with conformity. Unity still allows for individuality. The body of Christ is an eclectic weaving of diverse members. So we can be a part of the body and be united with the body and still maintain our uniqueness. 
You are unique. Your gifts are unique. Your calling is unique. Two people with very similar gifts may have very different <coughs> and unique callings. So I think I shared this earlier, maybe I didn't, but I'm, I'm a deacon, uh, a provisional deacon. And the order of deacons in the United Methodist Church has existed in its current, uh, in its current form since 1996. So prior to 1996, an individual was ordained as a deacon for a probationary period. And once they had completed those requirements, it's kind of like a stepping stone. Then they became ordained as an elder, which is what your pastor is. But now there are actually two separate orders. So I was commissioned as a deacon, and God willing, I will be fully ordained as a deacon once I've met some more requirements. Elders are ordained to word, sacrament, order, and service. Deacons, at least since 2012, there were some changes made at General Conference, deacons are now ordained to word, service, compassion, and justice. Many elders and deacons have similar gifts and callings and passions and interests. For me, the discernment between seeking ordination as a deacon or elder, that was difficult. You see, I love to preach, and I love to teach, and I've been involved in pastoral care. And then I know some elders who are very concerned about justice and compassion. So, God, which way are you leading me? And one of the metaphors that I loved most, and that was really helpful in my discernment, was the image of deacons as bridge builders. Deacons are there to bridge, to connect the church and the community. There was something that I read in my first semester of seminary that helped me and that has stuck with me. And that has really helped me to understand how gifts and callings all come together. Frederick Buechner, he's a Presbyterian uh, preacher, he wrote, The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Amen. My calling is to Detroit, to the city where I found new life and new hope and new connection to the body of Christ. My appreciation and my gladness for all that life in Detroit has brought me fuels my desire to serve in a city where the needs and the hunger are great. Part of the work that I'm involved now involves going out to local churches and helping them to get out into their community, to engage them with their neighbors, to help them create ministries that are vital and meaningful to those outside their doors. I began by sharing a little bit about the city of Ephesus, and there was a reason for that. I reminded us that the Ephesian church and their social location influence their faith. And I did that too for a reason. Ephesus, an important urban city. Detroit and Flint are important urban cities. Cities with similar challenges and struggles, with similar history, with similar injustice. Cities with similar strengths and gifts just waiting to be named and claimed. Within each of these cities are citizens that are also citizens or members of the body of Christ. And within each of you here today, there are gifts, God-given spiritual gifts, that when named and claimed have the potential to transform your life and this congregation, but also the community that this church is a part of, and even the church as a whole. Do you believe that? Amen. I say it because I believe it, not just to make you feel good. To lead a life worthy of the calling is to live life with others in a community that functions as a single entity. A community that is individual and unique and diverse, yet completely united. Now, I do not have the gifts or the knowledge to make any claims about whether or not six degrees of separation is a valid theory. But my life experience and my faith leave me sure of one thing. 
When it comes to our spiritual gifts and our calling, there is no sixth degree of separation. There is only one thing separating us from our God-given gifts and the calling upon our lives. And that one thing is fear. We are afraid to name who we are, and we are afraid to claim our place in the body of Christ. Don't be afraid. God is with you. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, elders, deacons, Sunday school and youth leaders, nursery workers, musicians, office administrators, custodians, sound technicians, ushers, greeters, poets, preachers, and even yoga teachers, the body of Christ needs us all.